uh, time in Rome as a member of the Israel graduate, graduate delegation, excuse me, to UNESCO, and an academic uh, Israeli-Palestinian dialogue project. Recently, he gave um, an expert opinion report to the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, concerning the new um, wave, or even some would call it tidal wave, of global anti-Semitism. He focused on the situation in France um, after he infiltrated an anti-Israel rally in Paris, which is, uh, I hope David will have time to talk a little bit about his important work in Europe infiltrating anti-Semitic uh, movements. David also, what we should mention that David's uh, academic research is also based on the important contribution to, uh, by uh, Yiska Harani, who's not here. She's an independent scholar who's a se senior lecturer and a consultant on Christianity and Christians in the Holy Land with a focus on the Orthodox Church and its pilgrimage uh, to Jerusalem. Her recent paper entitled Tour Guide, Christian Groups and Unintended Interreligious Encounters was published uh, recently in Jewish Christian Relations in Israel, Jews, uh, sorry, Jewish Points of View, uh, Paulist Press. It's forthcoming in 2015. And her interreligious dialogue activity has won her the Mount Zion of Jerusalem Award in 2013. So she, her work is very much um, contributed to the work of David, what he'll present to you this evening. So David, thank you for coming and uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much, everyone. And um, I'm going to speak a bit on the research that I'm doing with this car for we're working on this project already four years. Uh, we're doing it right now, this evening, on the Israel Independence Day. Unfortunately, the topic is a bit more sad than it's supposed to be for this day, but I think it is very important for people who uh, do academic work on anti-Semitism to hear more about this issue, which is getting more and more uh, influence, and in a second I'm going to uh, tell you all about it. In 2011, the Irish uh, Solidarity Movement uh, of uh, North Irish Public Service Alliance uh, went on a solidarity uh, visit to, uh, to the West Bank, and this is what they published. Now, this is a leaflet that we received from uh, our contacts in Ireland, North Ireland, and uh, as you can see, it has a very clear message about uh, their political stand. So what you see here is Jerusalem, and they say, welcome to the country that doesn't exist. So we are not here to discuss politics. What, uh, what actually uh, received our attention is the next part of their report. So what you see here, let me maybe help. Sure. All right. So uh, uh, they went to different locations in the West Bank. And among them, they went to Nablus. And they visited a church called Jacob's Well. This is the church. Now, in their report, there is a very disturbing paragraph. And I read. I noticed it had, it, the church, had a tomb of a martyr, a Archimandrit Philomenus has a piece. I asked which century he had been martyred in, this one was the short answer. He had been murdered with an axe in a surrealistic manner on 16 November 1979 by Zionist settlers who wanted to cleanse the area from any traces of Christ Christianity. Murdered whilst performing vespers, his eyes were plucked out and three of his fingers were cut off. The ones which he made the sign of the cross. The attacker has believed to be an American. He was not arrested, but merely deported back to America. So this is the report. Now this report was distributed to every family that is a member in the North Island Public Service Alliance. And uh, we received it from our contacts in North Island. And uh, they asked us as scholars, as scholars, did we ever hear about this event? Now the same week, uh, I received a request from a group of Russian pilgrims that they are visiting the country 
and they would like also to go to the West Bank and visit this site. So it raised several uh, several question marks, and I contacted Iska, and we together started to work on this research. Now, what we found out, of course, the first source is to go to the internet. So, what we found out that there is the a whole popular narrative around this story. So, the first source that we started to check is a website called Orthodox Wiki, which is kind of Wikipedia for the Orthodox community. It's not public, it is run by a person who is partially affiliated by the church, uh, to the church, however, it is not an official church website. And I said the next thing. On the entry, Philomenes has a piece of Jacob's will, and I quote, the week before his martyrdom, a group of fanatical Zionists had come to the monastery at Jacob's well, claiming it as a, Je a, a Jewish holy site and demanding that all crosses and icons be removed. After a few days, on November 16 or 29, speaking about the Orthodox calendar, so the Orthodox calendar is about two weeks back in compared to the normal calendar. Excuse me. Yes. When you talk about orthodoxy, if it's Christian orthodoxy... Yeah, Christian orthodox, yes, 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 yes. Because you mentioned a fanatical group of... It's confusing me. Yes, so that's correct. That. Thank you thank you for that remark. When I say orthodox in this presentation and until the end, I speak only about orthodox Christians. All right, so after a few days, and I continue to read, on November 16 or 29, 1979, during a torrential downpour, a group broke into the monastery. They burst into the monastery and with a hatchet butchered a Archimandrit Philomenes in the form of a cross. By the way, the, the word Ar uh, Archimandrit, hope that I pronounced it correctly, that means the a head of a monastery who is also uh, certified as a priest. Was he real or a statue? Excuse me? Was it a real person or a statue? No, no, it's a head of the monastery. A monk who is also a priest and he's a head of a monastery. Okay. With one vertical stroke, they clothed his face. With another horizontal stroke, they cut his cheeks as far as his ears. His eyes were plucked out. The fingers of his right hand were cut into pieces and its thumb was hacked off. These were the fingers with which he made the sign of the cross, which is the sign that the Christian Orthodox made during the praying. The murderers were not content with the butchering of the innocent monk, but proceeded to desecrate the church as well. And immediately, uh, what it brought us to check these narratives that we read on the internet, it immediately brought us to check the parallels with different uh, medieval ritual murder accusations. And the first accusation that we know is the one of uh, William of Norwich, uh, which is uh, coming from uh, uh, Britain, 1144. But, uh, and of course, from there it's spread into different other parts of uh, British islands and then uh, also to what we call today Germany and France. Of course, all these names are modern, but uh, just to put you geographically. Uh, however, uh, most of these cases were later denounced by the church. Now, this is not the case when I'm speaking about the Orthodox Christianity. And for instance, uh, one example is a, a baby named Gabriel from Bialystok or Belostok, uh, who was uh, allegedly murdered by the Jews in, 18, in 1690, and he is still today considered as a saint in Orthodox Church, in Russian Orthodox Church, and he is still today venerated. And by the way, after the fall of Soviet Union, uh, his relics were. Uh, brought back to the church and uh, more and more people come to visit it and there was actually a very disturbing report recently about the increase of anti-semitic accusations that are uh, connected to this uh, story. 
So, what is disturbing about the, the case of Philomena is that we are not speaking about the Middle Ages, we are not speaking about the 17th century. We are speaking about 1979, and uh, if we go forward, then uh, we discover that in 2009, Philomenus became officially a martyr, a, a, officially a saint in the Orthodox Church. 2009. So this is yesterday. And since then, the pub uh, publicity of this case uh, became more and more uh, intense. So I would like to show you one video just to get impression of what we are speaking about. Um, translation ceremony. Translation is uh, Christianity, the ceremony when uh, relics of uh, a saint, holy relics, are uh, transformed or transferred into the place where uh, a public can venerate them. So this is a in November 29, 2008, when a new church was uh, inaugurated, uh, renovated in uh, Jacobsville, and uh, when uh, the church was open for the public, they also transferred the relics from Jerusalem into the church. So let's have a look. This is a long video. You can find it on YouTube. I'll just would like to show you a few uh, a few minutes of this video to in order to get an impression this is the church in uh, Nablus Jacob's well now pay attention to the flags what you see here are Greek flags and Palestinian flags of course Nablus is a area that is located under the uh, full rule of Palestinian authority. Look. Now, you can see the Greek flag, you can see the Palestinian flag, and you can see... You can see the signs that calls people to attend the ceremony. And you can see... Yasser Arafat Now I'm going a bit forward Second. Okay, so here you can see the relics transferred into the church and put into a special a, a special chapel dedicated for them All the worshipping is in a Greek. Now, have a look. After the relics were brought into the church, what you see is that, that the attendees of the ceremony start to venerate the relics. considered holy so when people come and they uh, touch the coffin or touch the glass it's considered that they are trying to inspire part of this holiness into themselves now I'm going a bit forward to the end so this is the patriarch Theophilus uh, of Jerusalem and uh, I'll just like to get to the end where you will see 
this is how the chapel where the relics are found looks like so basically you can see this uh, video uh, it's all uh, uh, can be found on YouTube and uh, see a lot of very interesting details into uh, that can add more meaning to what I'm going to tell you in the next half an hour now what you probably saw at the beginning that uh, uh, the church is located in Nablus. Nablus is area A, is under Palestinian authority control. And of course, such, such ceremony couldn't happen without the blessing of the authorities. In this case, uh, the Palestinian authority. Now, this was 2008. 2009, Philomenes was glorified to a saint and uh, in order to do that procedurally, the Synod, the Council of the Jerusalem Patriarchate, had to come together and uh, issue a decree or a decision that Philomenos is not only a martyr, but he has all the qualifications and all the criteria that he is also considered as a saint. Now, uh, what is interesting about this uh, about this decision that first of all uh, if we read it it has some uh, explanations about miracles that involved in his death his martyrdom and then uh, his lifestyle so for instance when he was killed drops of his blood left traces and stigmata so this is one interesting thing. The other thing that is totally uh, not connected to the religious side of the story, but very important for us, in the decision, the Synod says that Philomenus was murdered by a vile man. Not by group, not the Jews, not radical Zionists, a vile man. So definitely, it doesn't work well with the uh, popular narratives that we saw on the internet. So we started to look and check different sources that uh, elaborate about this case. And what we found out that we can put several points on uh, the development of the popular narrative. So first of all, we have collective accusations. So. Collective accusation can be against Jews, against radical Zionists, Israelis, settlers, you name it. Each source has different accusation, but I would say all the sources of popular narratives that we found are connected to, the, to a group. It's not one person. We also found out that it started from rumors and the reports and the news just in the newspapers just after his death that uh, uh, Israeli authorities are involved in that and that maybe settlers involved in that and so on and these uh, rumors caused uh, some uh, fraction in uh, Greece and in Cyprus I speak, in, uh, I speak I speak back in 1980 now when I speak about ritual murder several uh, parts constitute of that account. So he was hit in a cross form way. The sign of the cross fingers were cut, the fingers of the right hand. His eyes were plucked out. The body was taken away by the Jews and only after several days returned to the Christians. The incorrupt body was found in the, grave to, uh, in the grave after years, which is a symbol or a sign that the person was holy. We also read that the Christian holy artifacts in the church were destroyed. And uh, maybe the most disturbing thing is that nobody was arrested. And there is an alleged accusation that Israeli authorities tried to cover up this story. Now, 
We tried to get back and check the sources and try to put a finger on the first source where this story started. And definitely the story started from the rumors just after the unfortunate event in 1979. However, the first written one appears in a, actually in the United States in a, I would say it's a, a newspaper or a bulletin of the Russian Orthodox Church in America. And it says the next thing, the altar is a monk uh, named uh, Yechia Inovkian, who knew the person personally, but uh, at the time of the murder, he already was in the US. He wasn't present in Jacob's well. And he said the next thing. The week before, a group of fanatical Zionists came to the monastery Jacob's well, claiming it as a Jewish holy place and demanding that all the crosses and icons will be removed. The group left with threats, insults, and obscenities of the kind which local Christians suffer regularly. After a few days, on November 16, during a torrential downpour, a group broke into the monastery, the, a piecemeal chopping of the three fingers which he made the sign of the cross showed that he was tor tortured in an attempt to make him deny his Orthodox Christian faith. His face was cloven in the form of the cross. The church and the holy things were all defiled. No one was ever arrested. So, and you can immediately identify the connection in the story and in the formulation between the first account that I read for you, which is coming from Orthodox Wikipedia, and this uh, source, which dates back to 1989, and uh, I just read part of the long article in that bulletin. 2008, after the ceremony in the church, this event starts to gather more and more attention. And uh, here, uh, in another church bulletin, called the Church Messenger, again affiliated with the Orthodox uh, American Russian Church, you can see very similar formulation, but a bit shortened. Now, there is no reference back to that monk, uh, to Inovkian. It's written as a sermon by a priest, a, f a reverend, who in 2008 writes very similar story, and he uses very similar words, and I will not, I'm not going to read it for you, but you can just see that the freshes are very similar, a group of fanatical Zionists. Uh, before the Israeli state was created, uh, they chopped off the three fingers of the right hand. The fingers used to make the sign of the cross. No one was ever arrested, and so on. 2008, uh, an Israeli traveler named Daniela Schwartz visited a monastery in Cyprus. Now, what I didn't mention, that Philomenes originally is from Cyprus. He was born in Cyprus, and uh, until he moved to the Holy Land, he lived in Cyprus. And in that monastery, she discovered a painting. Now, what you can see here is classical, I would say, anti-Semitical uh, painting that you would find in Orthodox churches. And you can see a monk standing near the well, the Jacob's well. And you can see a, a person holding an axe who looks like a religious ultra Orthodox Jew. You oh, can I see. Excuse me? Like uh, and you can see that uh, he has all the attributes. Now he's attacking the monk. and. Uh, you can also can see here there is a grenade. Now, um, the traveler, uh, Ms. Schwartz, she reported about this uh, painting to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And uh, we know that Minister of Foreign Affairs put an official uh, complaint to the Cyprus authorities, 
but uh, unfortunately I didn't have the chance to visit the monastery and see whether it was changed or not. This is a painting from uh, Jacob's Well, and you can see that the themes are quite similar. Excuse me. Now, we went to the site, Iska went to the site, more correctly, and uh, discussed herself as a pilgrim, and uh, received some of the materials that are given to the pilgrims. So this is one, one of these materials. Materials. You can see there is a leaflet uh, that describes the story of Philomenes and his life. And uh, if you enlarge one section, you can see that even sorted in Greek, it's quite, it's quite easy to identify that it speaks about fanaticoi ebroi, so fanatical Jews. Again, collective accusations. If you look further on the internet, uh, you'll find out that, uh, for instance, on Russian uh, sites affiliated with or semi-affiliated with Russian Orthodox Church, there are very disturbing uh, accounts. So this is a church, uh, this is a site that is uh, run by a person who is not official uh, in the Belarusian Orthodox Church, but he holds the beliefs of the church. So he's not, he doesn't speak for the church, but he runs a website whose, uh, I would say, all context is about the Orthodox Church in Belarus. And what he says in his, uh, in his account, in Memoriam of Philomenes, the Holy Tomb Keeper Martyred by the Jews in 1979, uh, he describes all the story of Philomenes and uh, all the, uh, account of the popular narrative that I read to you before, but then there is also an addition. And I translated it from Russian. We remind that the Russian Orthodox Church has two saints venerated as martyred by the Jids. Jid is a, a very, I would say, bad nickname for Jews in Russia. Uh, the monk martyr Evstrati of Kiev Pichersk, and the infant Gabriel of Belostok. So it immediately puts us into that uh, framework. The martyr of Strati died in the uh, 11th century in Kiev, when in 1096 the Kumens attacked and revenged Pichersk monastery in Kiev, exterminating many of the monks. The monk of Strati was captured and with 30 monastic workers and 20 inhabitants of Kiev was sold into slavery to a Jew who crucified him on a cross. The holy infant Gabriel was originally murdered by Jews on April 20, 1690. His body side was pierced for purpose to discharge the blood. Then the infant martyr was crucified. This is 2011. And unfortunately, uh, it is not only a religious story. Philomenes uh, died on November 29, according to regular calendar. November 29 is a very special date. So this is a website from a Christian community in Syria that in 2013 published an article about Philomenes. And again, I'm not going to read it to you, but just a few keywords. Occupied Palestine, mob of Jews, of Jewish Israeli extremists entered into the church and his memory is honored annually on November 29, coinciding with United Nations International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. Now, November 29, this is the date of the famous uh, UN partition plan. And uh, since uh, the Palestinian state wasn't established, and you remember that the Palestinians rejected the partition plan and attacked uh, the Jewish state, so, uh, Basically, 
they lost the war, and uh, since then the UN commemorates, or not since then, but since the UN decided to commemorate the Palestinian uh, uh, cause, they commemorate it on the day of the original UN partition plan resolution, which is November 29. If you go to secular sources, and Wikipedia, the normal Wikipedia, not the orthodox one, is definitely a, a, a secular source, it also gives us some uh, account that is very similar to the last one that we saw. So this is, uh, this is the original text that was in 2012 on the website of Wikipedia, and it immediately gives us the context. And he said the next thing, since the Israeli occupation of the West Bank, Jacob's Well has been a site of contentation between Christians and Jews. In November 1979, a week after a Zionist group came to monastery claiming it is a Jewish holy place and demanding that all religious iconography be removed, the custodian of the well, Philomenes, was followed hatred to death inside the crypt housing the well. No one was ever arrested for the murder. Very, very, very disturbing. Now, even more disturbing is that this narrative was adopted in few scholar publications that treated this narrative as an authentic elaboration of the events of 1979. So, for instance, the three volumes of the uh, Encyclopedia of the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict says very similar thing. In November 1979, a priest and a caretaker of the side, Archimedrat Father Philomenes, was murdered in, in the well chamber. Earlier than months, a radical rabbi settler and his followers came to the monastery and demanded that the crosses and icons be taken down. And then it speaks about a week later the extremists came back and tortured and killed the priest and desecrated the church. We are speaking about an academic publication. No one was ever arrested or tried for the crimes. And unfortunately, uh, this is not the only instance. So another instance that we found is in a book called Christianophobia published recently by Robert, uh, uh, by Robert Short, 2013, and I quote, settlers are violent towards Christians and others from time to time. In November 1979, as yet unidentified fanatics murdered Father Philomenes, an Orthodox monk, and so on, so on, so on, but what's important they gouged his eyes out and hacked off his fingers of the right hand, the one he used to make the sign of the cross, before ending his life. So, unfortunately, even a few scholars didn't manage to recognize the motive that stands behind the a popular narrative and treated it as an authentic account. So, we decided to try to establish the factual basis behind the story. And in order to do that, we did a, an analysis of two sources, of three sources. We checked the newspapers of the time, 1979 and 1982, when the murderer was arrested. We also got access into the archives of police. And we uh, concluded uh, we con conducted a few interviews with officials in Orthodox Patriarchate in Jerusalem. And uh, definitely the popular narrative has a lot of gaps that cannot be bridged in relation to the uh, factual basis of the events that brought to the unfortunate death of Philomenes. So this is from Haaretz, from a newspaper, a Israeli newspaper of 1979, when all this story didn't exist, basically, just a few days after the murder. And uh, it says the next thing. The Israeli police started the investigation immediately. At that point, December 4, which is 
several days after the event, 18 suspects were still arrested, and the body was taken to a foresting examination, Abu Kabir, in order to understand uh, whom to look and how, uh, and how he was murdered. 1982, the police finally managed to find the murderer. Now, the murderer was a Jew, but he was not from the area. He was a resident of Tel Aviv. Uh, according to the newspaper, his name is Asher Rabbi, or Rashi Rabbi. Uh, his uh, age is 37, and uh, he admitted in several murder cases of Jews and not Jews alike. So we are speaking about a person who was a serious, uh, a serial murderer. Now he murdered a generalist, uh, a doctor in uh, Tel Aviv. He murdered a family of a uh, kind of magician in Lod, and he also murdered Philomenes in Jacob's Well. And the reason behind that is that person is simply insane. He was sent to examination and was found incapable to stand the court and was hospitalized in a mental clinic. Now, in his investigation, he told that he was requested by the divine power to ban the evil, that he had hallucinations, and we know that from police records and so on. Anyway, we're speaking about typical insane person. And uh, you can see here another uh, newspaper from uh, 1982, where uh, they say that uh, the police in reinvestigating all the recent cases when uh, a person was murdered with axe, using axe. So, when we read the information in the police records, we find out the next thing. The destruction of the church was caused actually by a grenade, a hand grenade, that he threw inside. And when Philomenes uh, ran from the church after the explosion, he still was alive, the murderer jumped on him and attacked him with an axe. Now, he attacked him and um, hit him in his face. And in order to protect his face, Philomenes put his hands and that's why a few of his fingers were cut off. Now, we found out, and it's, uh, it is seen also on the photographs that are kept in the file, that not only the fingers of the right hand were cut off, but there was a finger from each hand. So all the accusations about the sign of the cross or that he was tortured are simply not true. Now, in the police records, there is wall testimony of the murderer that he experienced hallucinations and how he heard voices and so on. And uh, therefore, we also found the, uh, <clears throat> the decree of the court that is also kept in the police record uh, that he must be hospitalized in a mental clinic. We also managed to obtain from police an official statement. Unfortunately, the file is classified and uh, we couldn't take the documents outside the file, but we obtained an official statement about the relevant details in the, uh, in the file that confirms that there is no ritual, uh, uh, ritual murder, that there is uh, only one murderer and uh, all the uh, characters of ritual murder like cross form hits, eye plucking, and so on, uh, are, were not found on the scene according to what is recorded in the police uh, archives. So this, the question that we try to answer in our research is not only what, is, what are the facts, but how we got to the point that in 2015, this story gained so much publicity and how it got so, so much publicity, how it was developed. So definitely, 
there are anti-Semitic mo uh, motives in the popular narrative. Natural uh, ritual murder and absence of the body that, of course, was taken to the forensic examination, but there is an absence of the body. After it, after the murder, there were uh, descriptions about miracles attributed to San Philomenus. Uh, for instance, he was said that uh, when there was a, a crisis in Nablus between Israelis and Palestinians, Israel tried to attack the church, allegedly with tanks, and San Philomenus stopped the tanks, stopped the Jewish tanks, stopped the Jewish tanks, that's how it's described. Uh, when it speaks about collective accusations, this is one of the most, I would say, prominent topics that appear in the medieval blood libels. This tries to suggest that Jews conspire in groups. So it's not one murderer, but this is a group. And the same thing that was true in the uh, 12th century apparently appears in 21st century also in these narratives. The secretion of the church also comes uh, to serve a purpose, to show the believers, the pilgrims, that Jews are against what is considered holy. And also what is very disturbing is that in the Middle Ages, most of these accusations were distributed by rumors. In many cases, the church didn't uh, issue an official account of the story. In some cases, the church even objected it. But the rumors were much more stronger than any official document. And the story that in the 20th century we see is that all these narratives were born from the rumors. Now, Yanovkian, the one who f wrote the first written account, the monk from uh, the, <clears throat> the church in uh, Mississippi, used a phrase, said, satanically inspired tormentors. And in order to analyze it, we used that a uh, very important work of Joshua Trachtenberg. It's, if I'm not mistaken, from 1843 that analyzed the works, uh, the text from the Middle Ages. The, the work is called The Devil and the Jews. And Apparently, this is a very prominent theme in the Middle Ages when associating Jews with the evil, uh, with the evil force in order to show that the martyr is to defend the Christianity from the evil force. So, Jews are on the evil side, Christians and the martyr the saint are on the good side. However, putting this narrative only on religious grounds would be, I would say, only partial explanation for the publicity of this narrative. We believe that it is much more or equally inspired by the uh, I would say, anti-Israeli trends that appear in the contemporary media and social movements. And in order to do that, in order to do this analysis, we use the framing theory, which is common in communication studies and also in social studies. Definition of framing theory, frames are the process of calling a few elements of perceived reality by the news agent and assembling a narrative that highlights connections among them to promote a particular interpretation of the reported events. Now, I'm, I'm not speaking about Philomenes, I'm not speaking about the church, I'm speak, I even don't speak about Israel. This is a way how to analyze, in general, the hidden, I would say, agenda behind the news reports. And each news framework uh, each news uh, report has its own agenda. Framing 
activate schemas that encourage target audience, us, as people who see the news, to think, feel, and decide in a particular way. So let's see uh, what framing is about. First of all, when there is an editor of the news, he has to answer where is the story, right? So what I'm going to report, what I'm not going to report. This gets the first page of the news, this gets the, I know, the last page uh, of the magazine. Or this one we started the uh, uh, broadcast from, this will put, I know, in a minute 50. How the head title will be formed? What are the visuals? So if you, for instance, speak about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and we can do it about every single topic in the news, but if you speak about Israeli-Palestinian conflict, for instance, if you use this visual, right, which you see Palestinians behind the fence, it's totally different from this uh, visual, where you see Palestinian kids are trained in military camps or terrorist camps. By the way, I just said military and terrorist, right? And I'm getting to another point of the framing, which is term terminology. So when we use certain terms, it also part of the framing. It encourages the, ser the target audience to think or react in a similar way, uh, in certain way. So when I say military or when I say terrorists, that's part of the framing. Of course, there is also a question of background provided in the report and pers per, uh, persons who are interviewed and so on, so on, so on. Now, in order to make it very clear, just one short example. Have a look. This is from BBC website, Israel's profile as a country. And uh, they needed to decide about a picture to put on Israel's profile. They have a profile for each country. So what pictures they would put? I would say, if you would ask me, the first picture I would put is this one. <laughs> and it would be said, Israel is famous for its coastline. But you can also put something like that. Israel is special home of the Jewish people, right? And you can say that Israel is the home of many technological innovations. And if your uh, target audience is young, you would also put something like that, right? Barafeli. But BBC decided that the story is not here, the story is somewhere in different place. And the pictures that they decided to put was this one. And uh, the title is Israelis and Palestinians have been at uh, loggerhead for decades. So for BBC, this is the story, this is the framing. And this is something that put them the glasses, put on them the glasses, when they look on the news coming from our region. Gadi Wosfeld, in 1997, wrote a very interesting article, uh, actually part of a book, uh, when he suggested two framings of the media to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. One framing, which is usually adapted by the pro-Israel sources, pro or more pro-Israel sources, uh, is called law and order. When they look on the situation, they say, okay, the problem here is the terror. Uh, there is need to stop the violence and to restore order and law. And you can see, for instance, here, you can see the fence that is built, the, the barrier that is built in the West Bank. And you can see some Hamas terrorists, say it's Hamas, right? And uh, they say how unneighborly of them. So when you, as a target audience, see this picture, you have certain uh, judgment on the situation, or it encourages certain judgment. On the other hand, pro-Palestinian sources use usually injustice and defiance framing, which is defined by Wolfsfeld, where they say that the problem here is injustice. Palestinians are perceived as weak victims, they struggle for their freedom and fight to prevent denial of their rights and loss of their land. And you can also see here, this is Bethlehem. And by the way, this uh, uh, work appears usually uh, 
approaching the Christmas. So you can see Joseph and Mary coming to Bethlehem, but they found, uh, but they cannot get in because there is a wall, and uh, you can see the soldiers searching on uh, uh, Joseph and Mary, which of course makes the linkage between Joseph and Mary and the Palestinians, and uh, that they cannot enter their city, Bethlehem, and so on, so on, so on. Now. How all that is relevant for our case? The story is that frames are not only something that we can analyze the news by, but also this is something that appears in social studies when we study social movements. So Benford and Snow in, in the year 2000 wrote a very interesting article where they defined framing of social movements where they say that collective action frames are action-oriented sets and beliefs, sets of beliefs and meanings that inspire and legitimize the activities of the social movement. Frames are constructed as part of a shared understanding of some problematic condition of situation. They define as if need of change and make attributions regarding who or what is to blame? So, in other words, who are the bad guys? What is the problem? Whom to blame? And how to deal with the situation? When you have a social movement, your framing would be uh, analyzing the situation that you're facing in this way. So, Charles, at the beginning of my lecture, mentioned that I went to the Paris rally that was in July 2014 and took a few pictures there. So this was an anti-Israel rally in the center of Paris. And you can see, a, what you see here can be defined by school language as social movements. And you can see people here who support BDS, Boycott of Israel. But also, you can see here a few people with interesting signs. Peace needs justice, remember? injustice and defiance. So for these people, the situation is injustice. I don't know what is injustice. It can be injustice, Israeli control of the West Bank. It can be existence of a Jewish state. Uh, but for them, the problem is injustice. So let's go back to our case. The murder of Philomenes is not perceived as a criminal act, as it's supposed to be. Remember the Irish report? It is framed as a milestone in the alleged oppression and injustice in the West Bank. What many of these movements would call occupation. And let's see how the language is used. Remember we spoke about the terminology? So radical Zionist pointing it this uh, fresh is a pointing finger to settlers. A Christian holy site was 16 centuries before the Israeli state was created, meaning the people who hold the site are the indigenous population. Insults and obscenities of the kind local Christians suffer regularly. Again, goes back to what's happening with the Palestinians. And also, of course, they account the popular story that a, being a saint, Philomenes, after his death, stopped the Jewish tanks. It creates a parallel, a parallel of victimhood between Christians in the West Bank and the Palestinians. And, of course, since uh, Philomenes was, murder, was murdered in November 29, which is his same day, but also the UN Solidarity Day with the Palestinian people, it of course makes this parallel stronger and stronger. So we go to the conclusions. What can we say about analyzing this story and what does it stand for? So definitely there are gaps. There are gaps between the factual basis and the popular narrative. But there are also gaps between the official documents of the church, which is the Synod decision, and the popular narrative. 
factors that contributed to the development of the narratives, of this narrative, is anti-Semitic trends, geopolitical situation in the West Bank, but also interests of certain political players. In a second, I'll get to it. In a book, Saints and Society, Weinstein Bell wrote a very important uh, sentence. Whenever Christianity encountered a frontier, it had need of martyrs. So if there is a new martyr and a saint who is venerated and canonized, there is a reason behind it. So in the Middle Ages, when we check the uh, development of the ritual murder narratives, we see that uh, a lot of them were actually promoted by local clergy. They wanted to create holy sites, they wanted to gain, I would say, a respect, maybe influence. People would come to visit the holy sites, they would leave some donations. And uh, unfortunately, we believe that the same uh, the same uh, patterns can be seen in our modern case. Now, this is the current custodian, Father Justinus. Now, if you see a very interesting thing, this is his burial site. He already prepared his burial site. And you can see that here behind him, they're the same person, right? And uh, Robert, uh, Robert Short, in his book, Christianophobia writes that the current custodian, a veteran of several attacks already by the settlers, has prepared his tomb for what he senses might be a sudden death. Very interesting. Of course, when the pilgrims from Russia or from Greece or from Cyprus come to visit this site, this is not by coincidence. This, so basically, there is an interest from the site management to promote this story. Also, Philomenes was uh, canonized in 2009. 2014, April 2014, after, a, I would say, about 40 years that a, the embassy of the Jerusalem Patriarchate in Cyprus was inactive, a new embassy, exarchy, that's, that's what, the, uh, what the professional term of, uh, was reopened. And what you can see here is a photograph found on the Jerusalem Patriarchate website of, uh, uh, of the ceremony of uh, in, in our, in, inauguration, excuse me, of basically a, a the opening of this uh, church. By the way, the church is called Church of Lord Ascension and St. Philomenus. This is in Nicosia, in Cyprus. And the people that you can see here, you can see the exarch himself, uh, the patriarch from Jerusalem, and Archbishop of Kition of Cyprus, and also the patriarchate representative in Gaza and also a lot of different local politicians and ambassadors. Now, if you look forward, this is another picture from uh, that ceremony, uh, the Patriarch from Jerusalem, uh, Chris, uh, Chrysostomos, the Archbishop of Cyprus, and the Exarch. So basically, we believe that uh, the case is used in order to uh, I would say promote relations between uh, Jerusalem Patriarchate and uh, uh, the Cypr uh, Cypriot Church. However, the case is also used in order to promote church, to advance church interests in the Palestinian Authority. And you could see it in the YouTube video. And of course, the story uh, matches very well the 
patterns of uh, framing of pro-Palestinian sources and uh, the Palestinian narrative. So if we look on the history of the church on Jacob's well, we'll see that it was a uh, remained half built, neglected for, I would say, almost a century. But suddenly in 2008, it was reopened after serious renovation. And the renovation started just after the second or during the second intifada. So probably there were funds that found their way there. And the, the reason is the publicity of this case. And I would like to conclude with a very important passage from article of Professor David Hirsch. He tried to define anti-Semitism um, in a or a modern anti-Semitism as social phenomena in relation to Israel. And he said the next thing. Each instance of anti-Semitism in history left traces, and I quote, in cultural reserver ready to be drawn open upon and re uh, reinvigorated. Naturally enough, campaigning against Israeli human rights abuses often seeks to engender feelings of compassion for and identification with Israeli Palestinian victims and concomitant uh, feelings of anger towards Israel and Israelis. Sometimes anti Semitic themes and images are put to work to help this process. In other words, the fact that it uses the patterns of classical anti-Semitism is just because it works. And it works because this instance of anti-Semitism is still somewhere in the cultural reserve of the society, and uh, even if it's unconscious. So, our conclusion. Unlike other known cases in history where ritual murder allegations were solely on expressions of traditional anti-Semitism, in the narration of Philomena's murder are intertwined both the religious hatred of the Jews and motives of delegitimization of Israel. Therefore, the case is a prominent example of a contemporary anti-Semitism or the new anti-Semitism. And I just finish with this picture. So this is William of Norwich, and this is New York 2009. Have a look on this sign, Free Palestine, Free America, Free the World, Stop Jewish Terror Power. And our case basically illustrates the bridge between this to this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Um, thank you so much, uh, David, for this uh, very I mean, unique presentation. I had never heard of this specific case. Uh, and I'm very interested in, um, in the anti-Zionist rhetoric and the extent to which it becomes intertwined with ritual murder. And I'm trying to see this in my own work in the context of the Soviet Union, the anti-Zionist rhetoric that emerges in the Soviet Union, the late 1960s and early 70s, and how it does actually, so perhaps this is a, I don't agree with your last, with, with your conclusion, because the anti-Zionist Soviet rhetoric does bring together the political moment and the anti-religious moment, because mm -hmm. it does attack Judaism in conjunction with uh, Israel. So, but let's leave that aside. I wanted to ask you the 1979 case. Is this the first case that you see where you have this perfect symbiosis of uh, anti-Zionist rhetoric and the ritual murder? And the question about language, the terminology that mm -hmm. we discussed even earlier, it seems to me, if I, if I can follow you, because it, you really give us a sense of this transnational the movements, you know, from one place to the other, of this specific case, how you traced it, uh, it seems to me that 
the when the term radical Zionist is used is only within Israel and outside of Israel, if I followed you correctly, but correct me if I'm wrong, outside, so Cyprus and uh, Bialystok, it doesn't, you know, the accusation is never framed politically. It's not radical Zionist, it's Jews. I mean, the, you still have the collective accusation that it's Jews, so it's more religious as opposed to political. David, uh, sorry. Yes. Please, excuse me, please stay here, this is my here. All right, yeah. And please repeat the questions for camera. Repeat all questions. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, <laughs> so the question was about uh, using the terminology whether there is a difference between anti Zionist or I'll say ra uh, describing the attackers, the alleged attackers, as radical Zionist uh, in compared to describing them as fanatical Jews. Uh, I would say that. Uh, in Christian sources, we see both of them. So definitely there is an emphasis on fanatical Jews, but Zionism also appears there. However, in secular sources, we do not see accusations of Jews. We see only Israelis and, uh, and radical Zionists or settlers. So, uh, yes. And, uh, and another question was about, uh, it's, it's common that you had about uh, uh, the language, and you say that uh, in your research uh, in the uh, Soviet Union, uh, you see that they use very similar terminology, even so Soviet Union is very secular. And this is exactly what we're trying to say when we analyze this case. We see that the ancient superstitious terminology was reinvoked. And it was reinvoked not because a lot of people today believe in it on daily basis, but because, as David here says, it's somewhere there in the cultural reserver. And we can see today in Russia, in post-Soviet moment, where uh, more and more people are coming back to the religion. And uh, you can see that these ritual murder cases uh, all these martyrs are uh, experiencing, I would say, a new blooming of, wor of worshipping of them in Russia and, and Belarus. It is not because they were reinvented, but because these motives were present in the culture reserve of the society that were just put aside a bit by the uh, Soviet uh, propaganda and uh, somehow uh, was not allowed to express publicly. Yes. So with regard to framing. Yes. Of, it's of not mine. It's a definition by a, a lot of but scholars of communication. Too. There's a lot of framing going on with the Democrats. I understand that. That's not where I'm going with it. Yes. With regard to framing your presentation, and this is the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism Policy, I'm just surprised that you didn't use the term Judea and Samaria, but only referred to that area as the West Bank, because mm -hmm. there is such a, not a disconnect, but there's so many uh, uh, Jews worldwide, young people especially, who buy into this anti-Semitism. And when you're not really super duper careful with the terminology you use to promote mm -hmm. the Jewish side, such as Ju Judea and Samaria, I think you contribute to this anti-Semitism not knowing it. And that's okay. why I would think that you'd be more careful when you make your presentation to at least, you know, as an anti-Semitism organization, present it where, you know, it's the West Bank and the of Samaria and, and, and let people know that there is a difference. Okay. So thank you for your comment. Yes. So the question was about the usage of terminology, whether it is Judea and Samaria or to use the terminology of West Bank. Uh, so from the point of research, uh, I do not, uh, we, I and Iska, we do not try to take any side of framing. We try to be objective as scholars in order to uh, get research on the truth. Now, uh, both of these, uh, both of these terms, Judea and Samaria and the West Bank, are used in the contemporary research. Uh, they are also used by contemporary news agents. 
Uh, Judea and Samaria is a geographical term. Judea is the southern part, Samaria is the northern part. West Bank is a political term that was put by the Jordanians when they annexed the territory after the ceasefire agreement with Israel 1949. And uh, it is called the West Bank because the Jordan before that, the part of the Jordan Kingdom, is the East Bank of the Jordan River. So from my side, as a scholar, this term doesn't have so much importance. What I'm trying to do is to make my audience understand what I'm speaking about. So I use the political term that is frequently used today. Uh, I don't think that this term invokes any judgment, but you can equally say Judea and Samaria, or you can also say the central hill country. It's also an objective term, but uh, I'm, I'm not going to argue about it. Uh, you're most welcome to use any term you like as far uh, as you understand what are the origins of these terms. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.